Disney's theme park empire is massive. Since the opening of Disneyland in 1955, the company has expanded its parks across three continents at six different locations, with 14 theme parks, including two water parks, now open around the world. But these weren't the only parks that Disney ever planned to make. Over the years, there have been numerous new parks planned by Disney, which, through various issues and mishaps, never saw the light of day, with some making it surprisingly far along in their development, before ultimately having the plug pulled. And while some of these parks may have simply been cancelled due to budgetary constraints, for others, they met their end for far more controversial reasons. So in this video, let's take a look at Disney's cancelled theme parks over the years, where they were supposed to be, what they were supposed to look like, and what eventually led to their demise. So, as mentioned in the intro, today Disney has a total of 14 theme parks, including two water parks, spread across six different resorts. They also formerly had one additional water park, which closed in 2001. But if you rewind the clock back to the early 60s, there was only one of them, Disneyland. Still shy of its 10th anniversary, and still under the control of Walt Disney. Despite Disneyland's success during the late 50s and early 60s, at the time Walt Disney had publicly stated that he had no intentions of building another park elsewhere in the country. But behind closed doors, the Disney company was already looking at the potential for a second location. By 1959, Disneyland was already starting to run into problems related to lack of space, and so the park's options for expansion were growing increasingly limited, a problem that still exists at the resort today. Walt Disney had also become frustrated with the tourist trap type businesses that had sprung up around Disneyland, and wanted the chance to start afresh with more room and greater control. And so, in March 1963, he travelled to St. Louis, Missouri, to meet with the city's mayor and discuss plans to construct a new Disney theme park in St. Louis's riverfront downtown area. At the time, St. Louis was celebrating its bicentennial, and so the city was undergoing numerous construction projects, such as the building of the famous Gateway Arch. The project Disney proposed to the city was a new park, called Walt Disney's Riverfront Square. Not one to repeat ideas, Walt Disney wanted Riverfront Square to be very different from Disneyland. Unlike a traditional theme park, the Missouri Park was to be housed entirely indoors, in a giant five-story building stretching over two blocks in downtown St. Louis, just north of Busch Stadium, home of the St. Louis Cardinals baseball team. The estimated cost of the project would be $40 million, equivalent to about $400 million today, and was expected to bring in around 25,000 guests a day, about 5,000 more than 1963's daily average for Disneyland. The park would be themed around local Missouri history, as well as the history of other areas of Middle America. At the entrance, as guests enter the building, would be a street similar to Main Street USA in Disneyland, but this time, one side of the street would be a turn-of-the-century St. Louis, and the other side a much older New Orleans. One of the main attractions at Riverfront Square would be the Lewis and Clark Adventure, a boat ride that would take guests on the travels of the Lewis and Clark expedition of the early 1800s. The building was also to be packed with shops and restaurants, one of which was built into a riverboat which would sit out on an indoor water area. Disney also floated the idea of bringing dark rides based on Peter Pan, Snow White and Pinocchio to the park, similar to the ones in Fantasyland, but the limited number of plans available online show a greater focus on other historical and frontier type attractions. There was a plan for an indoor roller coaster based on the nearby Merrimack Caverns, a bayou boat ride which would send guests through a Louisiana swamp and eventually down a waterfall, the Jean Lafitte adventure telling the story of the French pirate Jean Lafitte, and lastly a walkthrough haunted house attraction set in an old manor. Unfortunately, the plans ultimately fell through. For many years afterwards, a rumour was passed around that local businessman August Bush of the Bush Brewing Company may have caused a dispute over Walt Disney's desire to keep alcohol out of the parks. But the real reason for Riverfront Square's cancellation was due to a financial dispute between Disney and the city of St. Louis, over whose responsibility it was to develop the land the park would sit on. Disney wanted St. Louis to provide the building's outer shell and the nearby parking, and only be responsible themselves for the interior. 
whereas St. Louis wanted Disney to pay for the whole thing. Additionally, by the mid-60s, Walt Disney was already far more interested in purchasing land in Florida for his Florida project that would eventually become Walt Disney World. And so in 1965, Walt Disney's Riverfront Square was scrapped. However, parts of the project would live on later in the Disney Parks timeline. Ideas for the Bayou Boat Ride and the Jean Lafitte Adventure were combined later in the decade to create Pirates of the Caribbean, which would open alongside a reimagined ride version of that walk through haunted house, Disneyland's Haunted Mansion. And in 1979, Elements of the Merrimack Cabins roller coaster would be used to inspire the Frontierland ride, Big Thunder Mountain. The next cancelled theme park wouldn't come until the 90s, with the beginning of a string of park ideas that all went unmade, all occurring under the watchful eye of, it's that time again, then Disney CEO Michael Eisner. Why is it always you, Michael? Why is it always you? As mentioned on this channel several times before, 1990 saw the start of the Disney decade. Eisner's bold 10-year plan to aggressively expand the Disney parks and other enterprises, during which, among other things, he promised a reinvention of Disneyland, a new park in Tokyo, and an expansion of the Disney parks to Europe. And in July of that year, would unveil plans for an entirely new resort in Southern California named Port Disney, a hugely ambitious project to be built in Long Beach on Queensway Bay. Disney had recently acquired the retired Queen Mary Ocean Liner, which sat in the existing port, and planned to incorporate it into a new resort which would also contain five hotels, a marina, a cross bay ferry, a monorail system, a cruise ship port, and most significantly of all, a $1 billion theme park backing out onto the bay, that they named Disney Sea. Disney Sea would of course have a nautical theme, and would double as both a theme park and a marine research facility, sort of like a larger scale Living Seas pavilion from Epcot, and I think perhaps a way for Eisner to compete with SeaWorld. The grand centerpiece of the park would be Oceana, a large two-story futuristic aquarium built out of decorative reflective orbs, inside of which would be the Future Research Center, a collection of interactive exhibits and a working marine laboratory. Surrounding Oceana would be several other nautical lands. First there was the Mysterious Island, a land themed to the lost city of Atlantis, which would feature a children's attraction called Pirate Island and a suspended thrill ride called Nemo's Lava Cruiser. Heroes Harbor was a land featuring the stories of mythical nautical adventurers, such as Sinbad and Ulysses, planned to feature a maze named the Aqua Labyrinth, whose walls were made entirely of water. There was also the Boardwalk, a turn-of-the-century American boardwalk based predominantly on Long Beach's former Pike Boardwalk, and next to it, Fleets of Fantasy, a harbour containing a variety of historical ships such as ones from China and Egypt, which would each contain as of yet unnamed restaurants and rides. Lastly, the original plan for Disney Sea contained references to several shopping and restaurant areas themed to Greece, Southeast Asia and the Caribbean, and even an experience where guests could be lowered in a steel cage into a tank full of sharks. But while the plans for the park were spectacular, residents of Long Beach were not so impressed. While the local government was initially quite receptive to the project, offering tax exemptions, parking garages and construction help, the residents of Long Beach were concerned that the new park would bring increased traffic to the area and that the 10,000 new jobs that were promised would be mostly filled by non-residents. The park would also require the filling in of 250 acres of ocean, which would disrupt the local ocean habitat, and pressure from local environmentalists resulted in Disney being denied the permits required to start development. Additionally, the project was simply too expensive for Disney to justify, with the total projected cost of Port Disney as a whole reaching the estimated $3 billion, all the while with plans to build Euro Disney, which eventually became Disneyland Paris, costing a similar amount. And so, in December 1991, the project was cancelled. Eventually, many of the project's ideas would see new life, as the Disney Sea Park would be heavily modified and relocated to Japan in 2001, as Tokyo Disneyland's second gate. Tokyo Disney Sea. This park would feature the same nautical theme, with an updated version of the mysterious island and a land called the American Waterfront, similar to the boardwalk idea, among other new lands. 
But for now, Disney Sea was shelved, with Disney choosing to direct its focus towards another potential theme park in Anaheim. At the same time as the plans for Disney Sea were being advertised to the residents of Long Beach, another park was being advertised to the residents of Anaheim, in a bid by Michael Eisner to pit the two cities against each other to secure a better deal for Disney. As another part of the plans for the Disney decade, Eisner announced Disney's intention to expand the original Disneyland location from a one-park, one-hotel site into a multi-park, multi-hotel resort, and at the centre of this expansion would be the new park, Westcott. As the name implies, Westcott would be a sister park of Disney World's Epcot, and would represent a similar utopian vision of the future, but on a grander scale than ever before. And I guess if Epcot stands for Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow, then that means that Westcott's got to stand for West Community of Tomorrow? Or maybe, I don't know, WOW. Eisner's super terrific community of tomorrow. To enter Westcott, guests would board a shuttle system that instead of taking them to the entrance of the park, would instead take them directly to the center. It's unclear to me whether this shuttle system would have been a walkway or a monorail, but if it was a walkway, I imagine it would have been something similar to the one at City Walk at Universal Studios Orlando. Guests would then arrive in Center Core, where they would be greeted by Westcott's centerpiece. This time, not Spaceship Earth, but Space Station Earth. A massive 300-foot replica of Spaceship Earth, nearly twice its size, and now gold instead of white. One of the largest structures Disney would have ever built. The rest of the park would be split into two themes, just like Epcot. A future world, sometimes referred to as Venture Port, and a new world showcase. Future world would be split into three sections, named Wonders. First, there would be the Wonders of Living, a new version of Epcot's now closed Wonders of Life pavilion, with a clone of the Body Wars attraction, and an expanded version of the original Journey into Imagination attraction featuring Dreamfinder and Figment. Then there's the Wonders of Earth, a pavilion similar to the land, focusing on the natural environment, allowing you to walk through desert, arctic, jungle, and underwater environments, and likely featuring a similar attraction to living with the land. And lastly, the Wonders of Space, potentially featuring a clone of Horizons. World Showcase would also be subdivided into the four corners of the world, rather than individual countries like in Epcot. First, there was the New World, which would feature countries from the Americas, and would have a companion to Disneyland's Main Street, a clone at the American Adventure Show, and an indoor spirit lodge, representing indigenous Canadians. Next to that would be the Old World, covering Europe, which would feature the Timekeeper attraction from Disney World's Tomorrowland, and a trans-European train ride depicting a chase across the continent. Typical European countries from Epcot would be represented, like the UK and France, but Westcott would also see the debut of Russian and Greek-themed areas. The third corner would be the world of Africa and the Middle East, which would have a ride depicting a rafting expedition down a fictional African river. And the world of Asia would feature a massive roller coaster called Ride the Dragon, following the Great Wall of China into the fictional Dragon's Teeth Mountain, perhaps similar to Expedition Everest. It would also have an Indian restaurant and architecture from India, Japan, and China. And linking all the lands together, collectively referred to as the Seven World Wonders, would be a boat ride called the River of Time. Set to be the longest ride Disney had ever made, it would act similar to the Disneyland Railroad, as it would connect each of the areas of the park to one another, with stops available at each point. In between stops though, the ride would be more like Spaceship Earth, with dioramas related to the stories and cultures of each land you're sailing past. Overall, Westcott was set to be a spectacular theme park innovation, far and beyond anything Disney had made by this point in history, with enough to say about it to take up its own video. But unfortunately for the new park, after its announcement in 1991, local reception to it was pretty similar to that of Disney Sea. The plan was to build Westcott on the site of the existing Disneyland parking, which would require the parking and other amenities to be moved to a new location. In total, Disney would need to acquire around 100 acres of additional space. Local residents were outraged to discover that this space Disney was looking for just so happened to be their own homes and businesses, 
something that they hadn't been made aware of. Many locals took to protesting Disney's new plans at city council meetings and by picketing Disneyland and handing out anti-Westcott leaflets. Others demanded extremely high prices from Disney for their relocation costs, owing to Southern California's costly housing market. As well as the relocation problems, residents took issue with the specifics of the park, mainly raising concerns about the size of Space Station Earth. At 300 feet, it was set not just to be the tallest structure at Disneyland, but across all of Anaheim, and many felt a giant golden sphere dominating the skyline would be a major eyesore. In addition to concerns from residents, as with Port Disney, costs were ballooning for Westcott, with the estimated price tag on the redevelopment of the area reaching $3 billion. And so, amid the financial problems Disney faced from the opening of Euro Disney, by 1995, Westcott had been cancelled. In my opinion, Westcott is potentially the best of the Disney what might have beens a really ambitious project featuring so many great ideas. Disneyland did eventually get its second gate in 2001, but due to a decade of financial problems and constant downsizing of projects, it wasn't Westcott, but the rather disappointing California adventure. But that's a story for another time. Even before the opening of Euro Disney in 1992, Disney was so certain of its success they had already planned a second gate in Paris. The park they had come up with was to be a sister park of MGM Studios, now Hollywood Studios at Walt Disney World in Florida, and would be named Disney MGM Studios Europe. Just as with the Florida park, the European location would be themed around old Hollywood, and would feature some locations that already existed in Florida, alongside plenty of other brand new attractions. Guests would enter the park through Hollywood Boulevard, in a perpetual twilight, as the entrance would be indoors due to the unpredictable winter weather in Europe. In the center of the park would stand the Chinese Theater, sometimes named the Grand Movie Palace on Plans, which would house a clone of the Great Movie Ride. There were also other attractions brought over from America, such as the show Superstar Television, the Honey I Shrunk the Kids movie set adventure, a New York backlot similar to the Streets of America, several special effects shows, and a sci-fi dine-in theater and brown derby restaurant. Additionally, MGM Studios Europe would gain an attraction that its Floridian counterpart didn't have, which was an as of yet unnamed gangster shootout dark ride. The speculation since has been that this was going to be the Dick Tracy Crime Stoppers adventure, based on the 1990 Dick Tracy movie, a fast paced ride through 1920s Chicago, with similar theming to the gangster scene of the great movie ride. Utilizing the relatively new technology of EMV ride vehicles, like the ones on Disneyland's Indiana Jones Adventure, and Animal Kingdom's Dinosaur. This ride would have been unique to MGM Studios Europe, and likely a big draw of the park at opening. So what happened? Well, simply put, when Euro Disney's first park opened in 1992, reception to it and subsequent financial performance was so poor that not only could Disney not afford to go ahead with a second gate, they were struggling to save themselves from bankruptcy. And so the park plans were put on hold indefinitely as Disney began to look for ways to save their existing European venture. Eventually though, Euro Disney's fortunes did recover somewhat, and Disney was able to look at the second gate plans once again. But by this point, the budget for the project had been lowered significantly, and so the MGM Studios idea was completely redone, with almost all of its elements scaled down or scrapped completely, and the park renamed to Walt Disney Studios which finally opened to the public in 2002. While you could technically say this isn't a cancelled park, because a movie-themed park did eventually open in Paris, Walt Disney Studios was so drastically different, I don't really count it as the same park as MGM Studios. But if you'd like to hear the full story on Walt Disney Studios, you can always check out the video on my channel. So very little is known about the plans for a Disney park in the country of Singapore. But as you may come across some references to it when searching for cancelled Disney parks, I thought I'd mention it very briefly here. The story of Singapore Disneyland is very simple. In the early 2000s, Disney was looking to expand elsewhere in Asia beyond Tokyo, and were interested in a few different sites. Rumours started circulating that Disney were in discussions with the Singapore Tourism Board, and had earmarked a plot of land on or around Marina Bay. 
Allegedly, the plans fell through mainly because Disney wanted around 700 acres of land for the resort, which was far too much for the tiny country, and so the project was scrapped before any real designs for the park could be drawn up, with Disney opting to build their second Asian resort in another small city-state, Hong Kong. The Singapore story is pretty uninteresting, and there's only marginally more information about it than, say, rumours that Disney once looked to build a park in London instead of Paris. However, the same can't be said for the final park I wanted to talk about, which may just be the most interesting story of them all. In 1993, Disney announced another new park, scheduled for a 1998 opening, named Disney's America. The park would be located near the town of Haymarket, Virginia, just outside of Washington DC, and would be themed around the history of the United States. Much like many of the parks featured in this video, the idea came mainly from, of course, here he is again, then Disney CEO Michael Eisner, when he and other Disney executives took a visit to the Living Museum Colonial Williamsburg. Disney's America would have nine distinct areas, each themed to a different time period in American history. The main hub of the park would be Crossroads, USA, set between 1800 and 1850. This would be a pre-Civil War village, marked at its entrance by an 1840s train trestle bridge, and an embarkation point for the steam train that would circle the park, much like Disney's castle parks. One planned attraction for this area was a show inside a large amphitheatre, named The Muppets Take America. But as this was the entrance to the park, most of the other attractions would be in other areas. Next to Crossroads USA, you'd find President's Square, set between 1750 and 1800. This will be a small land housing a clone of the American Adventure and the Hall of Presidents. I think most likely this would have looked partway between the American Adventure Pavilion in Epcot and Liberty Square in Magic Kingdom. Behind President's Square was a land named Native America, representing a large span of American history from 1600 to 1810, a recreation of a Native American village based on the cultures of the tribes in Virginia and the surrounding area. This would have also featured the return of an abandoned ride idea featured earlier in this video, the Lewis and Clark Expedition, which would now take the form of a whitewater river raft ride, similar to Carly River Rapids at Animal Kingdom. On the other side of Crossroads USA was a land simply referred to as Enterprise, representing 1870 to 1930, a turn of the century factory town depicting America during the Industrial Revolution. A nod towards one of Walt Disney's childhood heroes, Thomas Edison, and I think a second attempt at a never built area of Disneyland named Edison Square. Early concept art also shows this land would have housed one of the park's major attractions, Industrial Revolution, a high speed roller coaster through a 19th century steel mill. Next to Enterprise was its counterpart, We the People, also depicting the same time period. This was a single building representing Ellis Island, and a nod to America's history of immigration. Advertised by Disney as a powerful multimedia attraction, exploring the history of American immigration from early settlers through to political refugees. I'm not quite sure what a multimedia attraction exactly is, but my best guess is this would have been a show-based attraction, maybe with a walkthrough element, or perhaps similar to something like Carousel of Progress or Ellen's Energy Adventure. Across a lagoon in the centre of the park named Freedom Bay would be the Civil War Fort, from 1850 to 1870. A replica of, of course, a Civil War Fort, housing a Circle Vision 360 show about the war. Outside the fort, guests could watch live historical reenactments. The area would have also housed a seating area for a nighttime spectacular that would have taken place on the lake, depicting famous Civil War naval battles where replica ships would have fought against each other. And something that kind of reminds me of another park that I've covered on this channel, the French theme park Puy de Fou. The final three areas of the park all depicted the years 1930 to 1945. The first of these was the Family Farm, a recreation of an authentic farm from the era with hands-on experiences like making homemade ice cream or apparently milking a cow. The second was the State Fair, a tribute to small town America, complete with a 60-foot Ferris wheel and a wooden roller coaster. There would also be a functional baseball field in this area, where plans were in place to host an exhibition all-star game. And the last area in the park would have been Victory Field, an airfield showcasing various planes, 
predominantly from the Second World War, and a dueling inverted roller coaster named Dogfighter, where guests would experience a World War I dogfight. Disney's America would eventually also feature a resort hotel, an RV park, a 27-hole golf course, and nearly 2 million square feet of space designated for commercial and retail development. Unlike several other projects, Disney had already secured most of the land needed to build the park by the time it was announced, and they seemed to have the support of the local government. And while there were still the same concerns from local residents about the effect a Disney park would have on the local area, the main opposition to Disney's America was mostly related to the park's historical theme. Shortly after the announcement, a group was formed made up of prominent American historians, could protect historic America. They argued that building a theme park so close to the nearby Manassas Civil War battlefield was tacky and insensitive to the many that had died in the area. Other groups were formed to oppose the project as they felt Disney's America was trivializing American history, particularly its handling of the Civil War and of slavery. Should Disney really be attempting to commodify such a serious topic? Was it really appropriate for a giant corporation to present a whitewashed, naive reframing of history built so close to an actual historical landmark? In an event that, again, maybe deserves its own video one day, the media, politicians, and various groups of activists and concerned citizens were ignited into a frenzy both for and against the park. A group of 3,000 protesters marched on Washington to oppose Disney, and a Senate subcommittee hearing was even held around the validity of Disney's ability to build in the area. Which gave us the iconic moment where a US Senator questioned whether Mickey Mouse would have fought for the Union or the Confederacy. Now if we were here today debating whether Mickey would be wearing blue or gray as he interpreted for the visitors of this new theme park how the Battle of Manassas was waged, I would say that would be a worthy debate because I don't know whether Mickey was a confederate or whether he was a member of the Union forces. And considering Mickey is both a California and Florida resident, I'm not particularly sure about that either. Disney didn't make it particularly easy for themselves either. Eisner was very outspoken in his rebuttals of critics of the project, particularly the group of historians, saying in one interview, I read some of their stuff and didn't learn anything. It was pretty boring which just comes across as Michael Eisner trying to insult the historians rather than refute any of their criticisms. Senior Vice President of Disney Bob Weiss also created some very bad PR for Disney's America when he told the press, and this is real, that the park would have an exhibit that would quote, make you feel what it was like to be a slave. A comment that Eisner would have to disavow, excusing Weiss as not being used to speaking to the media. In any case, Disney did at least seem to be taking the criticism seriously, as in August 1994 they released an updated concept for the park titled American Celebration. This new version would focus less on the military and industrial history of America, and more on cultural history, featuring lands with names like democracy, family, and creativity, as well as a Street of America area, which would feature restaurants serving food from different cities, like Chicago, New Orleans, Los Angeles, and New York. And of course, still featuring a movie starring the Muppets. Because the Muppets make everything better. However, the damage to Disney's America had already been done. And in September 1994, Disney would announce it was abandoning the idea as a direct result of the controversy. But also in part due to the financial issues that had plagued Westcott and Port Disney around the same time. Through the failure of many of these parks, we did gain a lot of great Disney attractions, like Pirates of the Caribbean, the Haunted Mansion, the whole of Tokyo Disney Sea. Also, lots of the stronger parts of California Adventure started life as concepts at Disney's America. Soarin' was originally a ride at Victory Field, California Screamin' was originally the State Fair wooden roller coaster, and Grizzly River Run was originally the Lewis and Clark raft ride. But we also lost a lot of what could have been some really amazing rides. Paris's Gangster Shootout Ride, the Industrial Revolution Roller Coaster, and the Dragon Coaster from Westcott being among my favourite concepts. In fact, Westcott as a whole is the place I most wish we could have seen because of just how insane a theme park it might have been. The River of Time Ride alone being essentially five rides in one is incredibly ambitious 
And obviously, as with all parks, the concept is usually more impressive than the end result. But I think nonetheless, with Westcott, we would have got something very special. What I noticed when researching for this video is, with the exception of Riverfront Square and Singapore Disneyland, all of these parks were in some way halted by the failure of Euro Disney. It shows just how significant the failure of Euro Disney was for the company, and it's also interesting to imagine just how different Disney as a whole might have been had Euro Disney been more successful. Anyway, that's a quick look back at Disney's cancelled parks. There's a lot more that could be said about these that I haven't touched on. Honestly, each one could just get its own video of information, but I thought it would be fun to go over them all together in one video. Let me know your opinions on Disney's cancelled parks. Which one's your favourite? Which rides would you have most liked to see? Are there any you want Disney to bring to one of their other parks? Let me know in the comments. And of course, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing, as there are plenty more theme park videos coming in the future. Other than that, if there's anything else you'd like me to cover on the channel, please let me know. And as always, I'll see you next time.